Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about the incredible Gaia telescope. The telescope that for the past 6 years and 9 months has been extremely accurately mapping the entire galaxy around us, essentially looking at something like 1.6 billion stars. And it's been doing an incredible job at helping us understand the evolution and of course the past history of our own galaxy. So let's talk about the 5 major discoveries of the Gaia telescope and also talk about the future of this telescope and the future of so-called galactic archaeology. And let's begin with the brief introduction to what this telescope is and what it actually is doing. Unlike some of the other telescopes, this one has two different observational lenses and it's observing the night skies by essentially rotating around its own axes with a slight precession, allowing it to eventually cover the entire night skies by slowly spinning and slowly mapping everything. And it mostly does so by looking at a patch of a night skies and then taking each individual star and measuring very precise motion and also very specific spectroscopic observations of each individual stars it's looking at. And what's even more impressive is that eventually it's going to be covering all of the 1.5 billion stars looking at each star approximately 70 times on average. And all of these results will then be averaged out, allowing us to create an extremely accurate 3D map of a very large patch of the night skies around us. But more importantly, in the last few years, it's already done two major data releases, which allow the scientists to map a very large patch of the night skies and also get really accurate observations of the speed of various stars in the galaxy. And so in the past few years, there have been incredible discoveries about our own galaxy in regards to its evolution and in regards to major events that happened here billions of years ago. And the first major discovery was a group of about 30,000 different stars moving in a very synchronized way but almost in the opposite direction of the other stars in the galaxy. And these unusual observations matched previous predictions that our galaxy most likely collided with a lot of different galaxies, absorbing them in the process. In other words, it confirmed the idea that the Milky Way galaxy, like so many other large galaxies out there, was a type of a cannibalistic galaxy. It absorbed a lot of different stars and different types of matter from dozens and possibly even hundreds of different galaxies that used to orbit around it or came too close to the Milky Way. But the largest such collision with the stars visible right here in this image of the map of the galaxy and also the one simulated right here is between the Milky Way and the ancient galaxy known as Gaia Enceladus. The collision most likely happened roughly around 10 billion years ago and it resulted in most of the galactic matter being spread out across the Milky Way as you see in this simulation right here. At that time the Milky Way galaxy was only roughly around 4 times bigger than the Gaia Enceladus. So in the end this did contribute to a very large proportion of the total mass of the Milky Way galaxy. But today we know that many such collisions occurred and we're still seeing signs of them in all different parts of the Milky Way galaxy and in all different structures forming all sorts of rings and other shapes around the galaxy. The second major discovery was actually more or less recent. It's in regards to the idea of the creation of different stars including our sun in the galaxy. It seems that many stars have been forming around the galaxy in bursts. In other words, it's not really a continuous process. It seems that most stars are created around the same time period and then it slowly slows down until the next burst occurs. And at first the scientists weren't sure what causes these bursts, but it seems that there are more and more studies confirming the idea between the galactic passages and specifically certain galaxies moving close to the Milky Way and these star bursts occurring. More recently, the scientists were able to show that Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, which almost completely has been absorbed by the Milky Way already, with every single passage around the Milky Way, seems to cause very large bursts of star formation, with one right here 5.7 billion years ago, corresponding to the time when the Sun was created as well. In other words, the papers here suggest that at least a half of the stars in a galaxy were created during the close passages of certain galaxies in orbit around the Milky Way that may have been slowly absorbed with time. And it's most likely that all of this occurs when very large amounts of gas from both galaxies collide together and starts creating all sorts of stars all at once, causing these starbursts to occur at regular intervals. And all of this became more clear once we identified several stars from Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy 
and were also able to measure various times in the galaxy when certain stars were created. With the major star formations happening at least three times in the history of the Milky Way, and the ones caused by Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy happening about 5 billion years ago, 2 billion years ago, and 1 billion years ago. Which of course suggests that the galactic collision in this case, or the slow absorption of another galaxy, eventually led to the creation of the solar system, Earth, and us. The third major discovery here is in regards to the shape of our own galaxy. And the reason why this is important is because we can't really see our own galaxy from within it. We can see the Andromeda galaxy and we can sort of calculate the size, the mass, and even the number of arms in the Andromeda galaxy by looking at it directly. But the same is not true of the Milky Way. It's extremely difficult for us to estimate the size, the number of galactic arms, or even if we have any galactic arms, by looking at the galaxy from within it. And so this is where Gaia Telescope helped the scientists estimate all of this. And the current estimate suggests that our galaxy indeed has four galactic arms. And it seems that these arms on top of that are extremely dynamic and are obviously packed with a lot of gas and a lot of all types of stellar matter. Now, only a few years ago, we weren't sure if there were two galactic arms, three or four, or possibly even more. But because of the very precise measurements of star motion and star concentration in different parts of the galaxy, Gaia Telescope allowed us to very precisely see where these higher densities of star and dust matter were present in the galaxy, showing us where exactly these galactic arms are. With the Sun itself being located in one of the two smaller arms known as the Orion Arm, with the actual location being somewhere right here. But even though we were able to locate these over densities, there's still no clear idea or really good theory on how they're created and most importantly, what maintains them. In other words, there's currently no good explanation to why these galactic arms exist. But most of the theories today agree that these formations are very likely short-lived and are most likely caused by some sort of a gravitational instability on the inside. And this of course suggests that they will disappear with time, but will then reappear in a different location at a different time. But the most important discovery here is that these formations do not hold these stars permanently. The stars here come and go as they please. Some scientists even describe these galactic arms as a kind of a traffic jam for stars, where for some reason some stars get stuck for a little bit, but then will get to move on to other locations around the galaxy. Which in some sense is exactly what happened to our sun right now, because it's not really inside of a galactic arm, it's sort of on the outskirts. And in that sense, there are still a lot of things for us to learn about these unusual structures, how they form, and of course how this affects the solar system and our planet Earth, when our sun actually does enter one of these galactic arms once again. Another really incredible discovery coming from Gaia Telescope are the interstellar stragglers, or hypervelocity stars as they are also known. Gaia Telescope discovered around 20 or so of these stars traveling through our galaxy, and most of them have speeds high enough to never really stay in a galaxy and eventually escape it to become so-called intergalactic stars. But although the initial assumption was that most of these stars were leaving our galaxy and were most likely kicked out by, for example, interaction with some sort of a massive black hole, possibly even supermassive black hole in the middle of the galaxy, or by reaching these high velocities because they were next to a very large supernova, for example, if their massive partner exploded and they were close enough to receive this huge boost of velocity, it seems that the reality is much different. The majority of these very high velocity stars seem to be entering the galaxy, not leaving it. And this is really strange. It means that either there are a lot of these intergalactic stragglers traveling across the entire universe, but obviously it's hard to see them, or there is some sort of an unusual capture mechanism where the Milky Way galaxy is sort of stealing these stars from nearby galaxies and is accelerating them to tremendous speeds. So in that sense, there is really no good explanation, right now at least, for how these stars were created and where they're coming from. But thanks to Gaia Telescope, we now know there are at least 20 of them currently present in the galaxy, and most likely a lot more that we just haven't found yet. And the last major discovery I wanted to talk about is the discovery of the Radcliffe Wave. The structure that's ridiculously huge, but has no explanation, no reason to exist, and we seem to be surfing it. This was only discovered about a year ago, and it's essentially a tremendously large wave formed by something, stellar gas, stars, a lot of other matter in the galaxy, 
that seems to propagate for a distance of at least 9000 light years, with the sun itself being located right here and this here being the wave. It's a little bit easier to see it in one of the simulations uh, that I've talked about in the previous video, and you can sort of start seeing how extremely large the structure is. It goes up and down by about 500 light years, and it also seems to be about 400 light years in width, with the sun being roughly around 500 light years away from the center of this wave. It also seems that the sun has crossed this wave roughly around 13 or so million years ago, and will definitely be doing so again in the future. And know that this wave has always existed and it's always been there, it's really only thanks to Gaia Telescope we were able to see it in so much detail and understand that it's there and it seems to be causing stars to move in very unusual patterns because of it. But like I said, there's really no good explanation for what this is yet. There's also no explanation for whether these are present everywhere in the galaxy. And of course, there's no explanation to what effects this might have on planet Earth. And so these exceptionally interesting discoveries from the last few years all came from Gaia Telescope and from studies related to the observation of very accurate star motion in the vicinity. But the Gaia Telescope mission is far from over and it's still going to be providing us with a lot of really interesting details in the next few years as well. But because there is so much data it already has presented, the more difficult part for the scientists right now is trying to essentially analyze all of this and find out more details about the galaxy around us. And so, as some scientists suggested, this is currently the golden age of the so-called galactic archaeology, all thanks to one single telescope from the ESA. But once we discover more things from the Gaia telescope or from some other mission related to it, I'm going to make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe support the channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.